Hello and welcome to blockleaders.io with me, Gillian Gossel. Today I'm delighted to have as my guest Ali Madhavji, I'm going to say it right, who is the CEO, the managing partner of Blockchain Founders Fund. And uh, Ali and I met at a, at a conference, a virtual conference recently, and I thought he was so interesting, I thought I'd come back and interview him again. So Ali, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here, Gillian. No, thank you. So uh, at, the, at the conference, I was very impressed with things that you said. Um, and we have spoken a few times since, uh, but you basically three strands to your business. Um, you invest in early stage seed capital, you're consulting in the emerge tech area, and you have a venture program for startups. So tell me the first bit, the investment in early stage and stroke seed capital, what type of companies are you looking at there? Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking at companies between seed and pre-A, typically with some sort of revenues where you know we can understand sort of the path of growth for it. Um, we, as part of that sort of arm as well, we've, we've had set of, several strategic investments into other funds as well. Uh, so one of those is Loyal VC, where we're on the investment committee. Um, and we also just recently invested in another fund uh, in the last couple of weeks, which hasn't been disclosed yet. Um, and so we'll save that uh, for a little bit, but, uh, but that's an exciting sort of uh, very strategic investment for us um, into a, a very well-known uh, fund in the blockchain space. And, uh, and so, you know, between, uh, between those, those, the, the original two, uh, you know, we have well over a hundred portfolio companies. Um, and, you know, we're always just looking for incredible early stage founders across any part of tech. Um, that you know we we so we we're looking for very strong teams we're looking for defensibility of their product and, and a strong sort of product which can pivot though given the stage that we're at and so we see that quite a lot um and then understanding sort of uh some of the other aspects to it such as like market size and other factors that we tend to look at uh as part of that and what type of sums mm -hmm. are you typically investing in your startups yeah, so we're looking at generally between 50 to 200K uh, into the startups. And that's um, as well similar as what we look to uh, in the venture program into our companies. Okay, so that's the, the one end. And the other end, I'm skipping the consulting at the minute now. The other end is your venture program with your startups. So you've got about 30 companies in your portfolio, you were saying. So as, in addition to investing money, how do you support these companies? Yeah, so this is where we're extremely hands on with with our companies in the venture program, right? So we're looking at three major factors, right? So one is strategy, second is product market fit and early stage sales traction and supporting them very hands on to do that, especially leveraging our data science team. And then the third is helping these companies to become investment ready. And that's where, you know, we, we also invest in those investment rounds and help them drive those investment rounds. And you know, this has been a big part of why our companies have been, you know, so much more successful um, through the program is because it's very, very hands-on. So we don't look at it like an accelerator. Um, although a lot of people sort of consider it like an accelerator on steroids, you know, we don't do group programming, for example, we won't put 10 CEOs in a room and talk about how to fill the top of the funnel when you've got CEOs across like ed tech, ag tech, music tech, media entertainment, like it just doesn't make sense to us. And so our whole thing is how do we be hyper-targeted, you know, with your specific company uh, to actually go and, and do a lot of these things, right? So if we're looking at, you know, business development, how do we figure out who the highest likelihood individuals are to, to buy it? Generally B2B is, is, is our sort of sweet spot, but we do have uh, quite a lot of success as well in B2C. But, you know, how do we hyper-target various segments and then sort of go from there do a lot of split testing a lot of automation as well and scale sort of that executive's time substantially very similar as well on the investment side in terms of figuring out like who are the relevant strategic investors um, and everyone in the world that would sort of fit that right and then figure out how do we actually bring them into you know our network get them interested and then you know, come in on the round, which is, you know, highly beneficial for the company, given they already have expertise in that domain. So do you then, you made a very good point. It's very hard to put round uh, pegs into square holes. So doing like vanilla talks to CEOs from different industries is not necessarily good use of anyone's time. Does that mean then that you have to be an expert in lots of different in industries, industries yourself? No, so uh, we so our, our whole philosophy and what we always tell our CEOs is we're always wrong. Um, and, and we usually tell them they're wrong too. So 
Um, the main thing is really at the end of the day, it's figuring out and learning from your customer, right? And, and this actually doesn't matter what we found, even if you're an expert in an industry for 25 years, like you probably still don't know every nuance of like why they'd be buying your product, the different value, what other value they could get if there was other things that you could be solving, like you usually still don't know all of those things. Um, and so this is where customer discussions are very, very important to figure out. And so we bring, of course, a lot of experience across like other aspects. And we do obviously uh, also very familiar with a number of industries, but we usually look for one, the, the team to bring some of that domain ex like uh, expertise or industry expertise, but two, um, primarily we look at the customer and, and creating proper feedback loops and structures to make sure that we're always building the most effective thing uh, for the customer and driving and maximizing the amount of value. Them. So you help the individual CEOs to interrogate their own customers? Uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't call it maybe interrogate, but for sure, creating proper feedback loops and surveys and, 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 and aspects around that. Um, but then as well, figuring out how to like target those specific customers that are more likely to purchase their product or use their solution. You mentioned you have a data uh, uh, analysis data team. What, team do, yeah. what do they do? Yeah, so, so our data science team is, is super beneficial, right? So, um, so basically they are experts at hyper-targeting uh, leads for essentially anything, right? And we sort of look at everything as sort of being a, a lead and then a funnel and then a process, and then you essentially have results that come out of it, right? So the first thing we do with, with all of our companies is make sure that they have goals and milestones, right? And this is not something that most startups actually do at an early stage. Um, and we don't plan super long out because startups don't necessarily have a, a super long lifespan if they don't figure things out fairly quickly, right? So we usually plan out, say, like six months from, from here, right? And we look at actually setting a number of milestones that are quantifiable. So let's say, as an example, the company has 5K monthly recurring revenue. We might, you know, have a goal that's let's get it to 20, right? So let's get this 4X, let's get this to 20. And we say, we can do that in, like the company can do that, let's say, like the CEO sort of determines, we think we can hit that in two months from now, right? Or three months from now. So then we would have essentially a number of goals. So like, how do you hit 20K MRR? Say like the average uh, customer is $1,000 uh, of MRR, right? That means we need 15 new customers, right? To go from 5K to 20K. So if we need 15 new customers and we think that we can close 10% of customer leads that we end up uh, having from the top of the funnel, um, then, you know, we might need to say, reach out to uh, 150 uh, customers and we might end up on conversations with, or the company might end up on conversations with say 30 of those customers and might close 50% of the ones that they end up on calls with and therefore they get their 15 that they're looking at, right? And so how do you hyper target and have you know, the re most relevant sort of uh, highest likelihood buyers coming in at that top of the funnel. And so there's a lot of sort of uh, segmentation and targeting. So once we know who sort of the customer persona is, which we sort of develop with our companies as well, then like, how do we actually target those individuals? Um, whether that's across like various social platforms, whether that's across email or across ads or other aspects. And usually there's like multiple sort of touch points. And then how do we essentially drive them into that funnel and, and increase conversions? And our team is, is very skilled, even with building, say, like custom, you know, scrapers and bots and other things to start bringing together a lot of the information that's necessary to be able to do this uh, very, very effectively. So your data scientist team, they help mm -hmm. each individual company build these, 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 um, the, the leads, yeah. the, the funnels. Um, Blockchain's in the name of the company, but it's not all blockchain. What's the percentage of block? It's Emerge Tech, though, would that be correct? Yeah, so, so, so we've got sort of the blockchain founders from the Scale X Venture program, right? And, um, and so we're about 60% uh, blockchain and 40% emerging tech. Um, and, and I think that's always important, right? Because the way that we also look at emerging technologies is the biggest benefit for growth is when you've got a convergence of these technologies, right? And so that's what really propels growth. And so when you start pairing, say, blockchain with, you know, AI or IoT or other aspects is where you can really unlock the most amount of growth because these technologies are at a point where 
it does make sense to scale and the, the benefits of putting them together are exponential, right? And so, you know, with that same sort of lens, we also look at emerging tech companies that, you know, could be an AI and maybe in the future, they're looking at things like blockchain or other technologies. And so to us, you know, we, we tend to focus across emerging tech, but blockchain, of course, is um, one of the sectors that we're, we're very bullish on. How do you find your startups or how do they find you? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so we do have uh, a pretty sort of global presence, which helps. Um, so we do have, you know, a lot of events that we speak at. There's a lot of people familiar with the content that we produce across a lot of leading journals. Um, and so we do have a lot of inbound requests always um, through our website, through LinkedIn. Um, we always have companies that are, you know, looking to join our venture program or looking to join um, and, and submit and details with us from an investment standpoint. Um, we also, I, I think we didn't, we sort of skipped over it, but also, you know, given that we sort of work with the United Nations and, and leading institutions like INSEAD, which is one of the leading business schools, there's also sort of a lot of, um, I think, visibility around what we do there. Um, you know, in, in addition to that, um, you know, our team is also uh, always looking to identify great startups. And so, you know, as part of that, we're, you know, judges at a lot of, you know, leading, uh, you know, competitions. We've got uh, our team as well um, in a lot of different like startup forums, et cetera, that, you know, are there to help startups, even if, if they're not necessarily part of ours. I mean, they always give, you know, advice to startups and help startups uh, to solve different problems, direct them in the, in the sort of the, the right way. Um, and so that's just part of, part of what we do to help also build the ecosystem. And tell me, um, in terms of the startups, obviously the CEOs, the, the management team, or just the team, I mean, they're small, just have a team, very important. What's the gender balance? How many women are, are coming forward? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's something that we're always, uh, very conscious of, to be honest, um, from our pipeline on the venture program, we do find that there's uh, a lot less sort of female founders. And, and we find this as well in, in blockchain quite a bit, um, which is, you know, I think an unfortunate thing because, you know, we would of course like there to be more female leaders. And we've seen a lot of success even with uh, female leaders um, of companies from our, from our other, you know, main sort of portfolio. Um, so I would say it's 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 quite low right now. Um, but having said that, it's something that we are very conscious of. And so actually on our overall portfolio, including the loyal side, um, where we're on the investment committee, et cetera, you know, loyal side's at 30% actually female founders, which wow. is substantially above uh, the average. And so, you know, that's something that we're also uh, proud of because, you know, it is an important part. And, and to be honest, we're also seeing strong returns. So it's, mm. it's not, um, it's like for us, it's, it's about merit. Uh, and we do see that though. Because I've been, I've read study, quite a few studies in this area. And it's interesting that, you know, you're right that there are fewer women. Women traditionally have, have find it more difficult to get access to venture capital in particular. But then conversely, when women go on and they get to lead a team, and even if you have a woman in a decision-making role within an organization, um, even the presence, the presence of one woman can increase the profitability of that, com of that company between 20 and 30%. So it's like, oh, def it's, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, you said your returns, but it's, it's actually a no-brainer. Once you get past that kind of initial prejudice that you know, women don't get the money, you know, give them the money <laughs> and you'll make more money as a result. So, um, What's been your most one of your most exciting projects to date that you worked with? Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, we've got a, a lot of exciting projects. I think that's sort of the the benefit of of what we do, just being across so many industries, right? Like we've we've literally got companies in fintech, ed tech, ag tech, you know, music tech, media entertainment, you know, uh, health tech, um, you know, uh, insect tech, fitness tech, like lots of lots of things. Um, I mean, like some of them, you know, some of the notable ones probably to, to mention, um, you know, Splinterlands, of course, they're, they're the number one blockchain game and uh, tend to sort of go in and out of the number one decentralized application in the world. Of course, doing really, really well. If you, you know, if the audience has not um, tested out NFTs or non-fungible tokens, um, gaming's a great way to sort of see that in practice and, and definitely sign up to Splinterlands. If you don't know how, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but also, 
you know, companies like banks, which is one of our neo banks out of Europe doing extremely, extremely well right now. They're out of the UK. Um, you know, Beeped Up is uh, one of our music tech companies that recently got ranked in the top 20 music tech companies in the world by Crunchbase. Um, and, you know, they're uh, essentially an auditor for music streaming uh, services. So there tends to be a discrepancy of about 15% between recorded plays and actual or reported plays and actual plays by uh, streaming services to labels and artists. And so this is actually a, a very big deal. So they're doing uh, very, very well. Uh, and there's there's a number of others that, um, you know, if, if you've got, for example, US uh, listeners or, or viewers, um, you know, Jonathan recently launched the lowest cost health coverage in the United States and it's game changing, right? It's 25 bucks a month for unlimited telemedicine, unlimited prescriptions for your entire family across all 50 states, 65,000 locations. Um, really, really cool product. So that's been doing really, That sounds really well. amazing. Yeah, game, game what's changing. happening in the US and the dismantling of Obamacare and oh, and then everybody out of work and with the pandemic and, and yeah, wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah, so they're they're doing quite well. And so there's there's lots of different companies that are just doing like phenomenal things that are pushing the boundaries in their industries, right? And that's what you know keeps us excited to to keep driving forward and and uh, you know just helping drive part of this movement. Without naming names, tell me a disastrous project you <laughs> invested in and, and we'll never go there again. Is there anything that jumps to mind? Yeah, I mean, there's been some, uh, you know, for sure. And, and part of it's always been improving our due diligence and our sort of processes that we take companies in on, right? And so right now we've actually got uh, a process that now goes through 90 different things before we decide to take on a company. And so it's pretty comprehensive that our, our team goes through in the background. Um, so, I mean, there, there's been several, I mean, that's sort of part of, part of the game. Right. Um, but I mean, you know, what one in particular, uh, was a company that, you know, we, we believe that they were sort of like quite strong in terms of their traction, their traction wasn't there yet, but in terms of like their roadmap was sort of quite strong and, and, you know, we were pretty optimistic on it and, um, and sort of one of the challenges that we found was it was they were just very good at sort of um, some of the documentation and some of the you know talking about what they wanted to do but in terms of actual execution you know wasn't really there and it was one of those that we probably you know rushed into a, a little quicker as well um, and um, and so you know we we obviously cut cut our losses there at some point but um, but it just, there was not the progress that we sort of expected. And even when we tried to support the company very closely, um, it tended to sort of uh, just sort of not, not move in the way that we anticipated. And so, you know, that it happens. Um, but, you know, we've, I think, done a really good job now of minimizing these sorts of aspects uh, by getting to know our companies quite well before, before we also come in. And what's the normal, uh time when you exit what's the, the timeline for you entering and then exiting yeah so in terms of of uh you know our due diligence sort of timeline uh we do actually get back pretty quickly so despite these 90 things that we're looking at internally um uh, you know from when a, a company sort of comes to us and, and shares information with us we're usually will like trying to get back to them at least within the first week or so with questions and and sort of get onto a conversation within a couple of weeks and uh usually within less than within less than a month we're already coming to a decision and in some cases quicker um and then actually so do, I'm, I'm missing and then in terms of yeah and then yeah. in terms of um in terms of exits we sort of look at this as long term i mean the stage of companies that we have like we can't be looking at you know okay we're going to exit in three years like it doesn't it doesn't make sense it's just not rational to be honest um and so our our whole philosophy is we're there to support the companies long term um, we do have, you know, several companies right now with acquisition offers on the table um, and they're sort of, you know, discussing and going through those. And that's, you know, that's a good thing. Um, but given the stage of our companies, I mean, there's uh, a lot of potential and sort of the paths that are going and, and it is a long journey uh, to support them. Right. That's, that's, that's something that sounds more interesting than a lot, a lot of VCs go in and go, go out again very quickly. And it's almost <laughs> the CEOs are left wrecked on the floor. What happened there? You know? Um, so tell me yeah. just to, to finish off, um, you, what type of 
describe your ideal complex. If someone is listening to this or reading the article that I write from this, what is your ideal company startup? What, what are you looking for? Yeah, so I mean, we're we're looking for you know a great founding team. Uh, I think that's always always important, but it doesn't actually matter on the background that you have. We've got you know founders that are first time CEOs or extremely experienced CEOs that are you know Emmy nominated or taken numerous companies public or, or whatever, right? Uh, but you know, a strong founding team. We generally want to see a pretty strong tech side, so that that's that's important for us. Um, you know, if they've got that side pretty figured out. Uh, we want to know that, you know, they've had a lot of conversations with their customers are able to start getting sales or at least a path to, you know, how they're going to be doing that and not sort of building in a bubble. Um, we're also looking for founders that are quite coachable, which is sort of a bit unique uh, in terms of what other uh, people look for. But for us, we do want to make sure that, that they're coachable because we will challenge, you know, the way that we're approaching the market. We will challenge on, you know, how we could do things differently and you know test things out and we're our whole philosophy is around like failing fast it's like i said before we're always wrong and and probably is our companies as well and so we got to just figure out and test things right and, and figure out what markets work like we don't know the answer and it's it's one of those things where there's a good hypothesis and we go with it and we then test keep testing things out right and so that's a big part of our our philosophy um, and then we, we very much believe in, in very strong customer centricity. And so we actually even get uh, all of our companies to watch a video um, by Simon Sinek when, uh, when, they, when, they, when we start working together because um, customer centricity at the end of the day is, is the most important thing. Um, so those are, I mean, some of the different aspects. Of course, our team is also going through like what the market looks like, what the idea is, all of those aspects. But to be honest, there's so many times where the ideas pivoted even in the first call uh, with us or like how they're approaching the markets pivoted in the first call. Like this is actually quite common. Um, and this is this is sort of also some of the value of going through this process because you might see things differently. Even if we don't end up working together, you might see things quite differently um, and just, you know, learn from, from like the wealth of sort of things that we've seen and, and experienced um, on how to approach some of these markets. Brilliant, brilliant. So if people want to contact you, how can they reach you or where's the best place to go? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, so, social media is uh, great, um, you know, on Twitter or on LinkedIn is is, is good or, um, you know, our website is, is generally the best if you're looking for uh, investment or our venture program. There are uh, forms uh, for each of those. And uh, that just helps us to get get um, a little bit of a better understanding of you. And our team reviews all of those basically on a, on a daily basis, right? So we actually review 100% of them. We don't skip any. I know a lot of people say that, you know, they reach out to, to VCs and never hear back. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, we do try to reach out um, and do our best to actually, you know, respond to, to every single company that, that uh, comes into us. So. And what is your website? So it's uh, www.blockchainff.com. Um, and, uh, and then I can send you the links for the forms maybe to include in with the video, uh, right. notes, but, uh, but yeah, and then always happy to, to look out for, you know, great entrepreneurs with just, you know, great ideas. And, uh, it's never too early as well, I think to, to approach us just because we are, you know, very open to, to giving advice and helping companies even pre-product, right? Well, that's very promising because oftentimes I think people, entrepreneurs are scared to go near funders. VCs or whatever, because it's like, oh, I haven't, you know, it's, they're not fully formed yet. So, and I like one point you've made, I really like that, that you like coachable leaders so that you can work with them. And that makes a lot of sense. Wow. Well, thank you very much for your time. I shall post those details again at the bottom of the link for the video. And of course, in the right written article itself. Thank you indeed, Ali. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jillian.